We've all been uniquely and lovingly created in the image of God and called to live in fusion with Him and with one another. I'm Robert Richard Ellis, and welcome to The Converging Zone. Welcome to The Converging Zone. Today's guest is Kay Strom. She's an author, a speaker, a modern day abolitionist. Welcome to the show today, Kay Strom. Kay, Thank you so welcome. much. Great you, are, to be here. you are known as a 21st century abolitionist. And you know, we, back in the day, we were abolitionists, there were abolitionists, a modern day abolitionist. How, how did you get there? The abolitionist idea is the same. Yes. Then they were fighting against slavery. Today, a 21st century abolitionist fights against 21st century slavery. You know, there are four times as many slaves in the world today as there were in the days of the African slave trade. Wow. People don't realize that. It takes a different form, of course. It's not slave ships and so yeah. forth. But it's, it's a hidden blight on our world. And really, we should not rest until that is erased. We all should be abolitionists. We really. should. We should. And, I, and I, I love that word because I haven't used the word. But I, I don't, I, I feel like I fight against slavery or bondages, right, yeah, of different right. kinds. But you're talking about real slaves. Now, does this include the sex slave situation? It does. Okay. That is a major part of it. Actually, surprisingly, the greatest number of slaves are in India and Bangladesh who are in bonded slavery. But the most visible type of slavery is trafficking and sex slavery. And That's we right. have, we just did a show not too long ago, we have a lot of sex trafficking and slavery right here in San Diego County. That's right. That's it's, right. It's unbelievable. There's not a state in the union that doesn't have situations that involve sex slavery. We think of it as being a problem of, of other countries, yeah. but it's our problem too. It is our problem. And, and we should all take, 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 mm -hmm. uh, take up arms that will have, and I want to find out what you're doing for this. What, tell me about how you got started. I mean, uh, wh what is, give, give me a little part of your journey and how you got involved with this. Well, it, th that's an interesting question because one of my books, I wrote the um, biography of John Newton, the author of Amazing Grace, yeah. who was a slave ship captain. And it was interesting, I was in, um, in West Africa researching that book. And the people that we were with took us to an old um, slave fortress called Gory Island, right off the coast of Senegal. Wow. And while we were there, in one of those rooms, we saw these teeny little manacles bolted to the wall, like this, that would fit maybe a two-year-old child. And we thought, what could ever make civilized people think that was all right? It was then that I thought, I want to look more into this and see how these, these people, Christian people from Christian nations, were different from us and the things that we think are all right. Yeah. I mean, we have, you know, even in this country, I've had people say, well, you know, we got the black president. You know, less, well, 50 years ago or even less than that, there's, it wouldn't even be a, on anyone's mind that we'd ever have a black right. president. may not be the black president yeah. people would want, mm -hmm. but we have a black president in America. Mm -hmm. So we've come a long way. We've come a long way. But there's way. a lot of other nations that haven't come That's a right. long way. Yeah. And you've visited some of these. How many countries have you actually visited? Over 40. We counted, my husband and I counted not long ago. You guys get to travel and together we a lot? Just, we travel together some. Some. But then sometimes we travel separately. Yeah. But, but uh, many of the countries that I've been in are, people ask me when I come home from travel, did you have fun? They, it's not fun, but it is a blessed time. Yeah. So I go to a lot of hard countries. Yeah, yeah. And, and you go there to be a blessing. Isn't that something, isn't that yeah. something how God's economy works? We go to be a blessing, but we get blessed even more. That is so true. When I first went, I thought, oh, they are so fortunate to have me. I just have so much to offer. But I'll tell you what, I got 10 times as much as I gave. Wow. Mm -hmm. I, I can't wait to hear some of these stories. Mm -hmm. So you do write and you speak. I mean, you know, yeah. you've done, how many books now have you done? 39? 42. 42, 42. books. Mm -hmm. Wow, I'm still waiting to get my first book done. <laughs> when did you get your first book done? Oh, I can't, yeah, back before you were born probably. No. Back in the late 80s. Late 80s. Mm -hmm. I was already 45 at that oh. time. 
Well, I'm just kidding. I know you weren't. <laughs> <laughs> or you have a very good plastic surgeon. Yeah, exactly. exactly. Yeah, so. it was, it, it, but you know, it's interesting because when I was first writing, I wrote, my, my idea was, what will be published? What will sell? That's yeah. what I'll write. It's only been in the last maybe 12 years that I have been writing what I, what is really in my heart. Yeah. And that has, has been a real change in my writing. Yeah, so, so now you're, you're writing from what's in your heart, your passion. That's right. Uh, whether it sells or not, it's not that's not, not the point, but it sells. You're right. Well, that's interesting because when I first wrote my first book, that I traveled around the world and interviewed women of the most persecuted countries and wanted to tell their stories. And when I approached publishers that I'd been working with for a long time, they all said, it'll never sell. Nobody in this country cares about anyone outside our borders. It's too bad, but it'll never sell. But finally, InterVarsity Press said, it probably won't sell, but we still think it's worth, worth mm. it. But it's been one of InterVarsity's top sellers. People do care. What we don't, what we don't want is to be told that something's wrong and there's no hope, there's nothing you can do about yeah. it, because then we feel frustrated. Yeah. But if we're told what needs to be done and how we can help, it's a different story. How even one person in their lives can make a difference. That's right. And it's we'll, we'll talk about how, right. how that can happen. What are, would you say, in the countries you visited would be the ones, you talked about Bangladesh, what, what are some of the others? What is the worst countries for this type of modern day slavery that you're talking about? Well, oh boy, it's a hard question. Maybe India with, with the caste system that adds the debt bondage um, and just captures people in so many types of bondage. Yeah. That is probably one of the worst. I just got back from India and I've been in the brothels in India and interviewed women who are in those brothels and it's interesting because while I was doing that, a guy who was, I don't know if he was the owner of the brothel or a manager, the guy in charge, yeah. he stood there and just kind of smirked the whole time. And then he said, don't you think you're better than us? If it were not for Western businessmen and American pornography, we would be out of business tomorrow. Wow. And I, that's what I said. Uh, so, you know, it, it is easy to think those people there who we hear who we talk, yeah, here's a good, that's a good question because we, we as Christians mm -hmm. um, can even become, tri we, we, we become uh, engaged in tribalism. Right. We talked earlier with another guest about the fact of, oh, this is us and that's them. That's right. You know, that's them and that's, no, it's all of us as us. Right. God cares for each one of us, Christian, non-Christian, doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. And it is our responsibility to look at other people and, and have empathy. If we don't have empathy, there's something wrong with us. That's right. If That's we don't exactly see right. the pain in some, because Jesus, he was moved with compassion. Power comes from compassion, from love. That's right. And if we're not moved there, there's something wrong with us. That's right. And we have to know in order to be moved. And that's part of the problem, I think, with, with the Christian community. We tend to kind of close ourselves off, develop our own language, yeah. speak among ourselves. And so we, we encourage and bless each other, but where are we as far as the world is concerned? Yeah, and, and we do become what they call them bless me clubs. That's right. And what's interesting is, look at how fragmented we are. Yeah. We call it, well, let's, let's go back mm -hmm. to the we of the mm -hmm. tribalism called Christianity. but. We're so divided ourselves. We, yep. we, we won't get along because this guy does it this way, we do it yeah. this way, this is the right way, that's the wrong way. And we're, we're, it, we're, we're good at arguing over the non-essentials of reality. It's so true. And I'll tell you, this is a lesson that really came home to me when I was in Cairo. There are 10,000 women who, who meet for prayer every month and they say, we celebrate denominations. If it weren't for the Presbyterians, we wouldn't have order. If it weren't for the Charismatics, we wouldn't have joy. If it weren't for the, the um, Orthodox, we wouldn't have a sense of history. We aren't complete unless we yeah, have all of us. That's correct. Isn't that great? That's the body, right? Yeah, how that's miss, right. How are we missing that? Yeah. It's very clear. We are missing it and we're missing out 
on huge, huge blessings because we miss the body. That's yeah. right. Well, Jesus, my favorite verse, John 17, that, the, that we would love one another so that the world may know about our Father, about Him, and become one with one another. We're not even, I mean, not loving and becoming one. And he says, as I and the Father are one. So that's a whole other yep. level of fusion, of connectivity. That's right. Uh, that we haven't even caught, that yeah. even even come close to coming towards. It. But I think some of us are moving in that direction. Yes, we are. I guess so. It's like you said, we're, we're moving in the right direction. Father, help us. And we need his strength to do it. We can't do it on our own. Mm -hmm. And we're getting there. That's right. And part of the reason we're getting there, I think, is because we have connections yeah. with Christians in other places, with the body in other places. In, in North Africa, they say, the problem is you have too much leisure time and, and uh, uh, the ability to get focused on these little minor details. They said, we can't do that. We, don't, we have to stick together or we're gone. Yeah. So it's, it's, it's a whole different feel that we learn from them, I think. Yeah. And, you know, as look, look at your books. And, of course, we've got a few on the table here. You are a storyteller. Yes. Uh, so that, that's one of the gifts you've gotten. When you first started writing, did you write from a story perspective or more from a reality? I mean, this is reality. You're telling a story yeah. that is reality, but you're bringing it in a story form. Yeah. Is that a different style of writing that you did in the beginning, or did you have you been doing that from the from the beginning? I've always been a storyteller. That's that's what I am, and my feeling is, facts and statistics are so important because they support yeah. what we tell. But it's the stories that move the heart, and it's the stories that stick with us. Yeah. Um, when I when I speak, people will come to me and they'll say, "Will you tell that story about?" the women in, in India that you talk to? Or will you tell this story? Tell, because that has moved me. They means, remember it year after year. Something. So I think the story, well, that's how Jesus taught. Yeah. Yeah. We forget that, don't yeah. we? Yeah. Yeah. And there was truth, mm -hmm. but it was an apparel or story form. That's exactly right. When you tell these stories in your books, how much of those stories are actually true? Are some of them are pieces of some and then put together? How much are actually true? They, I, I have to disguise details yes. and names. And I do combine at times because it's a little bit too laborious to tell this and tell this and tell this. It's better to, yeah. to come. But, but I would say in most stories, 85 to 90% is true. And, and it's all true, though it may be a compilation now and then. Now and then. Mm -hmm. When you hear people, tell us some of the stories of, of what it's meant to people. What, what, ha, there's, been a, there's been a motivation of the heart. There's been a stirring of the heart. And what has it done in their lives as it, as it moved them to, to go help themselves, to donate? What, what are some of the stories you're hearing from people that have read your books? Well, um, it, 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 that's interesting because one of the books that I wrote that's not here uh, talked about how our donations, how much they actually affect the individuals they're aimed for. I followed from the pocket of the donors to the recipients to see how it's changed their lives. Wow. And I got a call, it was on a Sunday morning, from a little old lady out in the outback of Alabama. And she called and said, have you ever heard of Alabama? And I said, yeah. And she said, we are really, really poor. We've never had any kind of a mission program because we can't afford it. But she said, we're going to start saving our money to buy a goat for someone. Can you help us send it to somebody who really needs it? And I said, oh, yes, I can. And that has, since that time, this church now that had never had a mission program, that was their year's program to buy a goat, they now buy five animals a year. Wow. to give and and it's they said we can do it we can do it I said yeah you can't do it so we really do make a difference when we hear people tell stories tell, like that tell the audience what does one goat mean to a family in these some of these countries one goat means the difference between life and death it it means the difference between scraping through 
life in poverty, watching your children starve to death, and having an income that allows for you to have your children educated and um, see a doctor when they're ill. It truly is the difference between One life goat. and death. One goat. What does a goat cost? A goat costs about $40. $40. And, and I have to tell you, I talked to a teacher in a first grade class in, in Thousand Oaks down here in Southern California. And this is a public school, but she, they were studying about Africa and she wanted her children to learn about compassion. So she told them about the possibility of maybe buying a goat. And the kids got so excited. They, they bought the goat within a, a week. And so then they said, what next? And, and teacher said, oh, no, no, that's all. No, 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 next. They bought a lamb. Then they bought another one. Then they want, said, what should we buy next? Maybe a donkey. By the end of that school year, those first graders had earned the money to buy school supplies for every child in this village in Niger that they had supported with 10 different animals. First graders. And they, had, they did it by searching in under the cushions for money that's there, wiggling their teeth and seeing what the tooth fairy would bring them. All the creative ways they found to raise the money because those first graders' hearts were changed. Their lives and their families are changed forever. Audience, a, one goat can make a difference. And we'll talk a little bit later about how you can purchase a goat for somebody. Mm -hmm. And so you have connections. You have... Uh, uh, abilities for, for getting this funding over to there and you have a nonprofit that takes care of that? I work, I work through an organization called Partners International out of Spokane okay. and they are a, a well-established organization founded in 1940 and they have people in these areas to see exactly what is really needed so they're not sending things that aren't needed right. to people who can't really care for them. Yeah. yeah. So that's who I work So they through. do it, and they're a good, right. good reputable Absolutely. organization. Mm -hmm. uh, in your initiatives, w tell us, what you, when you go to these places, what are some of the th your initiatives when you go, and you know, how, is it, how is it going? How is it going today versus how it was going 10 years ago? What, one of the things that I most am committed to doing is seeing from people in these areas what they need yeah, and i'll tell you good. the loudest call is for education for their children one i was in a, a bank a bank started by a group of illiterate women in india who earned enough of a profit from that bank that they were starting a school uh, for the children in, in the village there and for the abandoned children in the outlying areas and i sit, sat in a circle with these 10 women one could read and write. She took the notes. And I said to these women, how will the next generation be different because of what you have done? They said, you look at us. You will never again see a generation like us of ignorant women who can't read and write and are at the mercy of whoever comes and goes to the village. I said, you'll never see that again. Look at us. We are the end of an era that needs to be gone. Hallelujah. You know, what you said is really significant. You said, I see, I go there and see what they need. Uh, I heard, uh, I won't name the organizations, but they're huge. They went, they used, I don't know how much money to go into, um, uh, I think the Maasai people in Kenya, I believe is where it was. And um, they brought hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of, of toilets and showers. And it's not what the people wanted or needed. We thought they needed it because, hey, they can clean themselves and they can go to the mm -hmm. bathroom properly. Well, they're bush people. They, they, and they, yeah, they move Yeah, they have their own way. They have their own way. And based on what I heard, it was a waste of money because they weren't going to use those things. Mm -hmm. And there, that money could have been used for many other projects That's that right. they really needed, but they didn't ask. That's they right. didn't go there to really ask, what is it that you yeah. need? Even Jesus, he knew the guy was blind. He'd say, what is it you need? I want to see. That's right. <laughs> Jesus asked. Yeah. But, but it is. It's coming and, and meeting them in the needs they have versus yeah. us, our American mentality sometimes. That's right. I mean, it, it could be well intended, mm -hmm. but it's missing the mark because we're not asking them, what is it that you really need? What is it today that you need? Which could change right. tomorrow. 
That's exactly right. And an example of that is my husband and I were in Cambodia and we were shown by our hosts a, a clinic and it was totally supplied with everything any clinic would want. The door was bolted and it was falling apart. It had never been used because there was no doctor in the area. Wow. But nobody asked. They just said, this is what we're gonna do. Never used. So you're, it, it's so important. Plus, people, they need to know that their, that their opinions matter. Yeah. Wow. Okay, you, you are, you're telling a story. You're opening up people's minds and hearts, and specifically hearts, to a great need out there. Um, you've written some great books. Let's talk about a few of these books. Tell us some of these stories. This one here is The Hope for a Shredula. Shredula. And this is, this is the middle one of a series based in India. Okay. And it is a trilogy that follows a family that is outcast and is enslaved by a well-to-do Christian family and it follows them through three generations. Wow. This is the middle one. It starts in 1900. This is in the days of the um, independence for India. And then the last one that is in that pile, uh, that's the first one. This is the last one right there. Yeah, so the first this, one's which one? This one is the first the one. The Faith of Ashish, Ashish is the first one is of the, the first trilogy. One. And then this is her grandfather. Okay. And then she is grandmother of Davina. All of the names, Shridula, Ashish, and Davina mean blessing. Wow. And so we see how Christianity makes a difference, and we see how India has changed and how it has not changed yeah. in, a, in, in a century. Yeah. And, but we see what the influence of Christianity is. is you done. know, when I was researching these books, I talked to um, a, a scientist who is a, who is a Hindu, and he said, I am a Hindu. I feel like that's what Indians should be. He said, but I'll say, every single thing that has benefited India is because of the Christians here. He said, it's Christianity that has changed India. That's amazing. And it, and it is. So that's what this is. This book, this series came about because a man who spoke, was speaking out against slavery in India said to me, he said, you know about our people. You know about the untouchables now called Dalits. He said, tell our story. Nobody knows about us, and so nobody cares because nobody knows. So write our stories. That's what I did. And, you know, I don't know. For me, if I'm going to read one, I'm going to read all three. Mm -hmm. You can get all three. Casestrom.com is your website, right? Yeah. We'll have it on the screen. Yes. So those are those three. Mm -hmm. So get the trilogy there. Yeah. Now talk about these books here. This is that first book I was telling you that I traveled around and interviewed women of the persecuted church. Yeah. So, so this tells the stories. Daughters of Hope. Daughters of Hope. And this is the one that everybody said will never sell and that is one of the best sellers for InterVarsity Press. Wow. So that, when was this one written? This one came out uh, probably 10 years ago. 10 years ago. My, at the beginning, this was the first of my... 21st century uh, portion of my life. Yeah. And then this is a follow-up to that book. Follow-up. Yeah. This is Forgotten, Forgotten Girls. Forgotten Girls. Right, and yeah. that's a follow-up. So right. they should get this one first, or does it, if they it didn't get stand alone? It doesn't really matter. They stand alone. Yeah. yeah. The trilogy, I think, would be significant because that's right. generational, right? That's exactly right. And it's interesting because this, uh, I wrote about women. This is about the girls. Girls, the children are the ones that are going to influence the next generation, the adults are kind of set in yeah. their ways, but the children, oh, the children. It is about the next generation, really, it is. isn't it? I it mean, exactly we, is. We can progress. You know, I and mean, what's this one here? This one is Second about- Seven Half Adventure. Half, seven Half Adventure. It is the idea that most of us work to raise our families yeah. and to earn a living the first half, but when we get to 50, we have the freedom to work toward what will leave a legacy in the Lord's name? And that's yeah. what this one's about. So your first half of your life, you're working, mm -hmm. you're building. Second half of life, you're working towards significance. That's right. And yeah, I remember this reminds me of a book that, that they did years ago, one of the authors called Halftime. That's right. Yeah. This, is, this is along that. Yeah. What I did, there's an organization called the Finishers Project yeah. that is kind of like uh, eHarmony.com for Christians, yeah. for Christian missions. And um, so I worked with Finishers Project on this and I interviewed people who do everything from actually moving to Africa or, or somebody who 
works at their computer at home. All different ways of refocusing how you're gonna spend your life. So that's what that's that awesome. one is. Recentering. You know, mm -hmm. Sometimes we go off here, here, at some point we gotta refocus, recenter. Right. Awesome. Good book to get. Yeah. Um, what's 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 in the near future for K Strong? Where where are, you, where are you going next? I just got back from India, and I want to, and I'm going to be writing a book about a Christian scientist there and what he's doing. I've written about him before. I'm going to write another one about him. I'm also writing about initiatives that are going on in in Indonesia right now. But I'm also kind of writing some of my own uh, novels that um, have a historical basis. So I get my nonfiction along with my fiction in that, which is fun. Well, I celebrate uh, what God is doing in your life and your husband's life. Uh, audience, you know, get a hold of these books because you're talking about truth done in a, an amazing story form, but it's truth. And it'll stir your lives, it'll stir our lives uh, to expand our worldview, to see there's much more out there than our own needs. And we know this, when you start paying attention to other people's needs, you find in the economy of God that your own needs begin to be fulfilled. That is so true. That is so true. So be praying for Kay Strom. Go to her website, buy some books, support, buy some goats. Do you have the place on the website where they can help? I will put that on. Okay, she's gonna mm -hmm. add that to the website and she'll probably have it by the time we get this in, in production. Yes. Okay, it's been a blessing. Yes, it has been really good to be with you. We're going to have you, so you back someday. Great. I would love that. All Anytime. Right. Audience, thanks for being with us on the Converging Zone, and we'll see you again soon.